Good Shepherd Convent in Inwood, New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and this is Live and Local. It's our podcast dedicated to showcasing the musicians of Upper Manhattan. We talk to them about what they do, and best of all, see them perform live right here in one of our favorite local haunts here. Today, we are excited to speak with musician and composer Pedro da Silva. Pedro is a multicultural composer, equally at home, writing for orchestra, film, and Middle Eastern ensemble, and his rock band, the Tritone King. He's also an innovator of the Portuguese guitar, classical guitar, and other plucked string instruments. He has formed and recorded his own works as a soloist with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, the London Metropolitan Orchestra, and the Orchestra Lamoureux in Paris, among many others. The Jose Limon Dance Company commissioned Pedro to compose a ballet performed and recorded by the Manhattan Camerata, and also he is equally acclaimed as a film composer. Um, Pedro received awards at the Cannes Film Festival, Sundance, South by Southwest, and many others. The films he has worked on have been official selections over more than 60 international festivals. He is a faculty member at New York University, teaching composition, guitar, mandolin, banjo, and sitar. And he also presents master classes and lectures internationally at museums, universities, and other artistic institutions. We are thrilled to have him here today to speak with this and also play live. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy Pedro da Silva. So this is the Portuguese guitar and has a very unusual tuning. It's a fifth, a second, a fourth, a fourth, and a second. So it gives these beautiful chords. And it's totally different from other guitar-like instruments because the guitar is tuned in fourths except for one major third, but other than that, it's all fourths. The bass is all fourths. Uh, violin, cello, viola, all fifths. So they're logical instruments. This one is not. Uh, it's also tuned in octaves for the three lowest strings and in unison for the upper ones. So the upper ones are like a mandolin, but it doesn't sound like a mandolin because the tension is lower. And it's amazing because you can do a lot of uh, beautiful vibrato with it. Which is impossible on mandolin. So. Uh, that's some of the unusual characteristics of this instrument. Something else is that beyond the bridge, you have all these strings, like in a lot of guitars. But here it's very resonant, so when you play a loud chord, you can hear that ringing. And uh, because of that, it just sounds very, very shimmery, very beautiful. Uh, so the unusual tuning allows me to do several things. First of all, play beautiful chords that you couldn't otherwise play. And you can play harmonics. That sound totally different from a guitar. And I can also do harp-like sounds. So all of these things make the Portuguese guitar really unique and it only exists in Portugal because uh, it's a 19th century instrument. Um, and so Brazil was already uh, independent, so we didn't bring it to Brazil or Angola or Mozambique or anywhere else, or Macau. So that's the Portuguese guitar. Thank you. 
so the chords change completely to the normal guitar, to the regular guitar. Uh, so for instance, an A major on the guitar would look something like this, but here it looks like this. D major would look something like this, but here it looks like this. It sounds totally different as well because you have higher pitches than normal. The highest note on the guitar is this note. And I still have two more strings to go. So it changes quite a bit. Uh, G major, instead of this, it would be, well, there's many ways of doing it, but this is one, one of them. If you want more notes, then you could do it this way. Um, e minor, you could do it this way. Instead of just two fingers like this on the normal guitar, it would be like this. So it's, uh, it, it, you have to relearn completely all the chords because it just uh, doesn't work the same way at all. Now I'm going to play the most famous piece for this instrument uh, by Carlos Paredes called Canção Verdes Anos. It's from a film called Verdes Anos, Green Years. And so he called it Song, Green Years, Canção Verdes Anos. That was just awesome. Pedro, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You bet. And, um, you know, I don't think many people know or even saw a Portuguese guitar. So thank you for sharing that with everybody. And um, and I understand you moved around a lot when you were younger. Uh, and so it, it's like, you know, kids go to guitar shops and they don't like go, oh, I oh, that looks cool. What is that? I mean, they wouldn't even know what the heck it is. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure. growing up, moving around, you were exposed to a wide variety of styles. Yeah. And, uh, and so were you always called to music 
and the Portuguese guitar, I'll say, from a young age? Um, or when did you start, you know, just curious, like kind of putting two to two together? It's like, because uh, it's a kind of featured instrument today with you um, saying, you know, what, what, how did you get the bug with music and, you know, what drew you to playing? Well, it, it all started when I was 13, 14 years old. Uh, the very beginning was when my sister bought a little Casio keyboard ah, about yes. this size. The big sis. Uh, yes. And uh, it had four little samples that you could do. They were quite short. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just started playing with that. And I started, you know, composing my first little things, you know, with chords that I didn't know what they were called. And then my best friend had a guitar that belonged to his father that was broken and had uh, only three strings. We tuned it to whatever sounded good to us, and we made made up songs. So my father was like, he likes the guitar. Let me buy him a proper one. Wow. And so he did. He taught me my first chords because he knew how to play. Uh, he knows how to play a few chords. And, uh, and it was the same year that I discovered in a school bus trip Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And that changed my life. That I wouldn't be a musician if it were not for that album. That's wild. The Beatles once again saves people's lives. Yeah, and uh, so I bet it was the George Harrison sitar. Exactly. <laughs> How did you know? Well, because you know, I mean, if there's a, if there is a, I mean, putting two together, the Portuguese guitar, special instrument. I mean, the sitar. I mean, credit George Harrison for well, following his own. Uh, muse, obviously, but mm -hmm. bringing that to literally the Western world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, thing. I mean, other than people who are musicians who knew about it, really, that really was a foreign instrument to many people, I think. Yeah, it and was this... Particularly in pop music. Yeah, yeah. So, well, first of all, the, uh, a, the, the A side of the album, because we were using cassettes back then, I'm right. dating myself, but... I'm with you. I had, a, <laughs> I had cassettes, absolutely. <laughs> but the A side was amazing, and I was like, I know the Beatles, I know this is the Beatles, but I just didn't know these songs. Yeah. And they were just incredible, and so different, and so varied, and so fresh and new. It sounded like something that was recorded, you know, the day before, and by that time, it was like 20-something, 30 years old. Yeah. And then side B comes on, and I'm like, oh, Indian music. And I'm like, I need to know everything I can learn about this. And that was Within You, Without You. That's the first track on the B side. Wow, yeah. And so did you, did you want to focus on going to school then? Um, or did you start go, Or did you start literally focusing on composing your own work at that point? Um, well, I was always composing, even when I didn't know a single thing about what I was doing. Yeah. I was always just making things up. When right. I picked up the guitar... Uh, when I had a proper guitar, I was also composing, even though I didn't know what I was doing at all. I didn't know chords. I was just playing a little bass with a little melody, and it sounded good to me, you know? That's what it is anyway, right? <laughs> it comes down to it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> circle of fifths and all, damned be aside and all. It's like it's like in music theory. I'm, I'm not, I promise, folks, I'm not getting any more into that. Now. But, um, I mean, you know... Do you like it? I mean, as it comes down to for most composers, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. The math may be there, it may not be there, but do you like it? Okay, yeah. great. It's yours. <laughs> and actually, it. sometimes I kind of miss those days when I didn't know what I was doing because when I started learning, yeah. I was like, oh, no, uh, this measure here is in five. I can't. It has to be four. And then later I learned, well, you can do anything you want. Right. So I have a piece. Well, I, my very first piece that I played today, it started its life as a classical guitar piece, and I cannot remember it now, it's impossible to remember, but one of the measures of the main melody was in five. And I forced it to be in four because I couldn't have a measure of five in the middle of a four, four piece. And I really missed that. I w wish I could remember that because that's what came naturally. Yeah. That's what it sounded naturally to me. And uh, I, for the life of me, I cannot m you know, remember what it was. It's funny, just curious, kind of talking a little bit about like your composing style. Um, is this, does it? Do you start with an idea or how thing feels, or, um, or I mean, improvisation, um, or do you sit down trying to explore an idea like intellectually? Uh, just curious. I, I've done all of the above yeah. uh, and combinations of both, but if it's a piece for an instrument that I play, I usually start you know improvising and just you know finding out something that I like and something that really fits well in the fingers. Yeah. 
But if it's a piece for orchestra, for instance, right. uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I, I can start completely intellectually and I just start, you know, let, I have an idea, I hum it and I just, you know, write down the, the notes and then I think of what instruments can play it. And very often it's a combination of uh, all of the above. I play composer piano, as we call it. You know, I'm not a pianist, especially with my long nails. Cause <laughs> it's a little rough. Yeah. On my nails, at least. I have good technique on my left hand. But I have terrible flat-fingered technique on my right. We need to have your wife, who we've talked to earlier off camera, who is also is a pianist, so maybe you can do the left hand, she can do the right hand. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> She's a phenomenal pianist and a composer, and so she, she helps me. I write piano pieces for her. Uh, her name is Lucia Caruso. And um, and what I write for her, she plays, in the, you know, and she writes for me as well for, on the guitar. Oh. And we usually adapt each other's music so it fits a little bit better in our instruments or according to our technique. Right. Well, we'll have to have her on the podcast next year. Yeah. Um, looking forward to it. And I wanted to say, too, though, how great was that your dad showed you some chords? Yes. You know, I mean, is he was he a musician or just, just enjoyed playing music? I mean, because that's all it takes. No, uh, he, he, he was a diplomat. And so that's why we moved around to so many right. countries. Uh, but he knew how to play a few chords. Actually, he was in a band. Come on, give your dad some credit here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he was in a band. He's even in the book of rock and roll in Portugal, 50 Years of Rock and Roll. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, he knew more than... than, than Do you remember f- what his band was called? The Gentleman. The, well... <laughs> It's perfect for a diplomat, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> or at least at least uh, that's what the pub was, uh, we call it. The PR really the press release says, right? Exactly. Well, that's funny. That's really funny. <laughs> um, well, I also want to highlight uh, kind of keeping on the composer um, uh, genre, but uh, but sorry, composer, but moving genres is that uh, you're also you, you, fil- you score films as well, yeah. and uh, and you compose for film with the track record of great success, as I said earlier in your little bio that we cobbled together for you. Um, and we have a lot of filmmakers in this community. Uh, we have the we're going on our seventh Inwood Film Festival. Um, it'll be in the spring next year. Uh, submissions are open, by the way, if you're listening through December 25th. Feature shorts, sh- uh, student films, whatever we take them. Uh, so submit your film at inwoodartworks.nyc. A little plug there. But um, a lot of these are are, um, are people who have projects that are wearing five different hats, um, and you know, and budget sometimes. I, I got to score my own film, or oh my god, hmm. I don't know how to score my own film. But who? What I? Sh- I need to hire somebody. What should I be looking for? Um, and so, if you wouldn't mind, uh, since you have this great um, experience in this a- arena, could you share? Uh, you know. You know, if you have any cardinal rules you follow when you're scoring a film? Well, y- number one, of course, has to be the director's uh, uh, intent. So I may have a completely different idea of what the, the score should be uh, than the director, but I need to really follow the director's intent so I, I know what they're going for because there's, there's an infinity of ways of scoring the same scene. Yeah. Uh, sometimes without music, which I have suggested to directors, you know what, I know you asked me for music here, but I don't think it needs it. And I only do it when I really believe in it, you know, Um, and when I think it's going to help the scene. So sometimes no music is perfect. Uh, Movies, famous movies like The Birds, Hitchcock, uh, No Country for Old Men, basically has no music, has a couple of drones in the middle and uh, in the credits. That's it. Yeah. There's a few movies that don't need music um, or are done on purpose without music. Uh, so number one, there's that. Number two, uh, if the director gives me complete free reign, which has happened, I don't love it because I prefer to have a little bit of input because I may just go in a totally different direction than what they're you know, expecting. But uh, if they give me completely free reign, I look at the rhythm of the scene. I look look at the rhythm of the cuts, um, and that is going to give me a sense of what tempo could work. Um, They're not musicians, they're not, you know, cutting, and they're not also square, you know, cutting exactly to a tempo, but you can sort of feel a tempo, and a good director has a good sense of rhythm and flow. 
And they're very collaborative too, directors. They, they, most directors we know, well, particularly in the short film world, you know, they're usually the one who are the writers as well. And so they have definitely have a point of view that they want to express and follow. So yeah, it's great to have that, I feel like, collaboration. Yeah. And figure it out. But uh, are you working on anything right now? Like how did you get in that composer world? Uh, well, uh, composing for film, you know, just yeah. uh, kind of happened by chance. Uh, in 2007, I was approached by this uh, French uh, film director, Richard Temchin, uh, who lives here in New York. And uh, he wanted to do a, a, a French-American uh, comedy. Uh, he's also Jewish, so he has a wonderful sense of both French comedy, Jewish comedy, and American comedy. And uh, he saw my... Um, doctoral recital of composition okay with music that has nothing to do with any of the music that i wrote for the film but he liked the music enough that uh, he hired me to do his uh, feature length film that was a theatrical release called uh, uh, how to seduce difficult women <laughs> it's a french american you know, <laughs> comedy okay so um and um it's this French guy in the story, in the film, a French guy who was teaching a class of like uh, 15 Americans, and 10 of them are uh, main characters. So the French guy plus nine of the other characters. And um, I had to write different genre of music for every single character. Wow. So every 10 of them. Uh, and he, he said, for this one, I, I want French accordion, of course, for the main character. Uh, for uh, that one, I'd like some blues. Uh, that one, I want a Fellini-esque circus music. And I was like, what the hell am I going to do with all of this? Uh, so what I did was I wrote a melody that would fit a lot of these genres, not all, because the hip-hop wouldn't work. But um, And so I did a, a, a jazz tune that could be classical, that could be blues, that could be circus music. And um, and it just that's how I was able to thread all of those disparate pieces together into a cohesive whole. Well, that's the challenge, right? Yeah, it's like it's, it's a it's a quilt. Yeah, yeah you got to figure out a way of putting it all together. Yeah. Well, so the same theme actually makes the the whole thing uh, makes it work. come together. Yeah. Well, it's a great story. So if your filmmakers are out there listening, how it works and what you're looking for, a little bit of a, a little bit of nod in that direction for you. Um, and, uh, well, as you said, you've, you have an affinity for composing for different styles and also different instruments. And, uh, uh, do you have a favorite, uh, style or instrument to write for? My favorite instrument is, uh, definitely the Portuguese guitar because it's so unique yeah. and it's of a small country of 10 million people. So I need to bring it out there a little more. About the size of New York, a little, a little bigger than the size of New York. I mean, yeah. about that, right? Yeah. City that is. Yeah. Yeah. So I love writing for the instrument. I wrote the first concerto ever for the Portuguese guitar, uh, which I recorded with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Um, and, um, you know, I want to bring it forward. I want people to, to listen to it. Well, this podcast is another step in the advocacy for that, I think. And uh, we're looking forward to it. So um, let's actually go to it uh, for uh, a yet another tune. So uh, once more, Pedro da Silva. Because of the unusual characteristics of this instrument and the acoustics inherent to this kind of construction, this instrument is the only acoustic instrument that I have in my collection of 35 guitar-like instruments that allows the use of an ebo, an electronic bow that is normally used only on electric guitar. But this instrument is so resonant that you can actually uh, use the ebo quite effectively on it. And I like to use a slide on it so it sounds like other instruments. It's a metal slide, so it sounds a little bit interesting. So I have a piece that I normally play with a lot more musicians, but I'm going to do a little solo rendition, just a taste of the piece. It's called One Equals Three Equals Seven. It's one of those titles, long story. <laughs> 
don't know the Portuguese guitar by now um, they've uh, they need to go on Wikipedia or something and find out more about it or uh, find your next concert and I wanted to say too is that uh, um, you're a resident of Inwood you're around yeah. here maybe we can get you to do a concert a Portuguese guitar concert sometime around we here should with, with in the hood live for people to experience and uh, <laughs> just curious you've been here for about uh, two or three years right and, and uh, a little over little, two years little, yeah. little two years and um, just curious has um, has the neighborhood and its natural surroundings the people culture have it has it found its way into your music yet um you know uh, i live right next to kiskeya plaza where they have all the loud the music. new kiskeya plaza exactly marketing for you folks <laughs> and it's kind of funny that the neighborhood has changed in a little over two years yeah 
because this new Kiskeo Plaza was much quieter when I first moved in. <laughs> yes, the politicians got a hold of it and changed it. So, And every weekend this summer, there was loud, loud music. Yeah. <laughs> so it's changed. The, 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 the first two summers that I was here, um, there were just loud parties maybe three times. Your normal Dykeman Street, you know, summer fireworks, et cetera, so on. That's part of the character of the neighborhood this the, this uh this summer however it was every weekend unless it rained right so for recording at home it wasn't ideal on weekends but you know weekdays are fine right, right. <laughs> but uh, so that music you know bachata and merengue and salsa you know i don't know i think it's gonna seep into my music <laughs> <laughs> whether you like it or not <laughs> <laughs> understood totally get it um well uh what composition films or live performances or other projects do you have on the horizon that we could uh, point people towards? Well, I just performed in Argentina. So the third and final piece that I played uh, today, uh, one equals three equals seven, I just played in Argentina with a full orchestra, with a choir. Awesome. Four singers that were uh, a soprano, alto, tenor, bass, instead of a full choir, but you know. And Lucia, uh, my wife, was playing piano, and I was playing Portuguese guitar. And so we just heard it with like 70 people. Wow. And then I played it tonight. Right. With You're like, one... did you feel a little anticlimactic playing that? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> You're like, where is everybody? <laughs> well, but, it sounded beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. But, you know, when I'm alone, I can do whatever I want. So sure. I don't. <laughs> well, like I said, this is, you know, this, I hope that this is, you know, um, when, the reason why I started doing these podcasts, uh, we're finishing our fourth season here, um, is that we wanted to showcase artists like yourselves, and people should go out and find more of your work and 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 see you and, and be exposed to new things and learn about process and and ways of uh, and p- people's interests and like I hope that you are George Harrison for somebody else. Yeah. I hope that <laughs> they've never heard. Like you needed to hear the sitar before, they've never heard a Portuguese guitar before, and that maybe just maybe like their dad or their mom is playing the podcast to them here, and or they hear it in the background going, "What the heck is that?" And well, then, that happens to me every single concert. Yeah, everybody comes to me and asks me about about the instruments. Awesome. Uh, it's funny that most people go, "That's a mandolin, right?" And I'm like, nope. <laughs> it's not the Val de Gamboys. Uh, no, it's not that either. Yeah, no. Exactly. And and things also. Uh, little shop talk for a second with that you know where can one find one i mean there's they're not available you, you can't go to guitar center and there's a portuguese guitar hanging on the wall no i mean you, these are specially made instruments right yeah so you have to go to portugal yeah. although there is one store in california okay. i don't remember exactly where but uh, uh that sells portuguese guitars okay. and um, i think the guy makes them as well there wow. used to be there used to be a, a gentleman here in newark that used to make them but he sadly passed away a few oh. years ago wow and what are one of those run relatively in the range well a, a a really good one a concert one like this one yeah uh this one is from 1962 the year the Beatles started. Hey, I see the I see what's happening here, folks. <laughs> Meant to be, uh, and um, it, it's by the greatest maker of this instrument, uh, Gracio, and uh, it's like from his best period. Wow. So this one has no price. I haven't insured for nine thousand dollars, but it's. I mean, it's priceless, like the commercial says. Yeah, awesome. but uh, you can get a new one, a concert one. For about five thousand euros, four thousand, okay. five thousand depends on the maker. Depends on a lot of things. Uh, you can get cheap ones for like three hundred euros, I think. Okay. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend those. Um, of course, four thousand might be a little bit steep. Right. But you know, maybe work your way up to it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Well, uh, before we sign off, Pedro, where can we send people to find out more about your work? You can go to PedroDeSilva dot com. That's D A S I L V A. So uh, if you go to my website, you can see all the future projects. And, uh, well, the project I played in Argentina uh, is called Transclassical Rock. Awesome. And my latest album is Transclassical Concertos, which is out on all platforms. And the best way to find that is uh, uh, to look for Transclassical Concertos, like the way it sounds, or look for Pedro H. Da Silva. I need to use my middle name because my name is very popular in Portuguese-speaking countries.
It's all about branding these days too. People want to find you exactly, and don't make don't make them look for you. They get tired, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Pedro, thank you again. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you, Aaron. You betcha. You betcha. And we look forward to more great work from you ahead, and hopefully more in the neighborhood too. So, uh, listeners, uh, you can find uh, the links to, this, uh, to Pedro's website in the description of this episode. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Pedro, for joining me on this live and local episode of Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where I meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes to make their home here in northern Manhattan. If you have a moment, please show us some love right now and rate and review this podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts uh, or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, it really does help. Many thanks to Church of Good Shepherd here for hosting us and to Heightsites.com for uptown promotional support. You can support On Air and all of our programming by making a tax free donation to Inwood Artworks. Go to inwoodartworks.nyc backslash donate or go via Venmo at Inwood Artworks. Be sure to follow us on social media, keep up with all that we do, which includes the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, pop up art galleries, live performances, and so much more. Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, and Inwood Artworks programming is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air. Thank you.